Okay, welcome back to the Free Life Agents podcast. This should be FLA number 31. And today we're going to be talking all about cryptocurrency technology and real estate investing and how cryptocurrency and blockchain technology relates to uh, real estate uh, with a very, very esteemed (laughs) guest of mine today. Uh, He is an expert in cryptocurrency and real estate. He actually wrote the book, uh, literally called Cryptocurrency and Real Estate, uh, the author of that book. And um, he has a lot of experience in real estate investing in the past uh, with different commercial entities, uh, syndications, and then helping investors uh, relate that back into uh, crypto as well. So uh, my guest today is Steven Streetman. Uh, he's been on multiple podcasts, multiple uh, taught multiple classes on this subject. So he's definitely the expert in this subject. But uh, welcome to the show, Steven. Uh, excited well- to have you. Thank you for having me. I look forward to, to, to talking with you about all this stuff. It's it's very it's been very uh, interesting journey over the past few years. Really? This, everything moves so rapidly in cryptocurrency. I, I brought my book's a year old, and I think the principles are still good. But uh, I could probably write almost another book <laughs> on what's <laughs> happened in the past year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of what I wanted to have you on to talk about uh, as well. It's just because me personally, I don't know too much about uh, cryptocurrency and this this kind of blockchain technology when it comes to, I mean, just that in general and how it relates to real estate. So I'm really excited to kind of get your take, uh, you know, just me personally and for the audience as well. So if you don't mind kind of introducing yourself a little bit, maybe your background and then kind of giving us an idea of what, what's going on with, with blockchain. What is, what is all this? Okay. Well, yeah. uh, my my background's a, a little bit uh, eclectic. I uh, yeah. I graduated from Dartmouth with a, a special major wow. in music modified with mathematics, which okay. I created for <laughs> myself. I think I'm the only person who's ever had that major. Uh, I I broke codes and ciphers. I worked in the intelligence community for a while. I did sensor integration. I really had a career more as a data scientist than most other things. But like many other people who got into real estate, I read Ro- Robert Kiyosaki's book in 2004, January of 2004. And I started paying my head and stuff on the head and said, what am I doing trading hours for money? I mean, that book was a wake up call for I think many people. And so I started investing in real estate. And I had a a company like uh, six weeks later, and I had my first rehab that year, 2004. So since then, I've had a long journey through real estate, mainly focusing on commercial. And uh, I, I got involved with a group called the National Council of Exchangers. And this is a group, it, it, they're probably the most creative deal makers in the country. They trade properties like baseball cards. <laughs> you know, I'll give you my free and clear house and a $300,000 note for your fourplex. I mean, it's really, it's really, really very kinds of uh, creative deals. Um, which, and they have four conferences a year. And there's another group that's, that's similar to them. It has six meetings a year. And through that group, I was actually offered an altcoin, which is not Bitcoin, right? It's, <laughs> if it's not Bitcoin, it's probably an altcoin <laughs> yeah. and uh, for real estate. And so I had to do the due diligence on it to try to figure out whether it made any sense or not. I ended up making it work as a three-way exchange. And since then, I've just been fascinated with the synergies between real estate and cryptocurrency. And I started looking at all the different things you can do, you know, tokenizing real estate, using real estate in your real, using t- cryptocurrency in your real estate business. And then, of course, buying and selling real estate with cryptocurrency. And I, I realized after a while that uh, everybody I knew knew one little piece of it. And nobody had really looked at the whole thing. And so I thought I'd write a book to, to kind of bring it all together. And that was, that was the genesis of the book. So I guess that's sort of a, uh, you know, two minute nutshell on, on, on myself, but you're talking about you know, what is cryptocurrency and, and what is blockchain and how does that all apply? So I have a very different take on that than most of the people you will talk to. Most of the people who invest in cryptocurrency are speculators. They want to buy something they think is going to go up in price. And unfortunately, a lot of people in real estate are also speculators. They want to buy a house and hope it goes up in price. Um, There's a lot of parts of real estate, though, that are investors. They buy for cash flow. They buy for some other investment characteristic. 
And so when I look at cryptocurrency, I don't see a bunch of coins and tokens that might go to the moon. What I see is the internet of transactions, right? Now the internet came out, there's all kinds of ways of exchanging data. You could put a website up, you could have forums, you could, you could you know, email came out really well, right? There's all kinds of social media, there's ways of connecting, there's all kinds of things that came out as part of the internet. But whenever you did something to buy or sell, you were going back into the, the old you know, 1980s, 1990s modes of transaction. You put your credit card in and it went through the credit card company and it came to the bank and, and all those same things were still there. there. There was some ease of use, but there was really no new way of doing transactions. What Bitcoin did that nobody else had done before was it found a way of transacting, of exchanging value without a counterparty in a trustless way. So it wasn't some, you didn't have to know the person, right? You could do this anywhere in the world. And there's no third party like a bank or a credit card, a card company in the way. There's nobody in the way. And so the real promise of cryptocurrency, in my opinion, is being able to do trustless uh, transactions with no counterparties in the middle. So, so what happens, of course, now all these counterparties try to step in the middle. <laughs> so you have, you have exchanges, right? And the exchanges are counterparties. They hold your tokens for you. They help you make your trades. They help make distributions. That's okay. I mean, it certainly provides a service. It makes it easier for people for, to use for people to do. But but they're a risk, right? I, I often call it the Dillinger effect. You know, John Dillinger famously said when he was arrested for robbing banks, well, why do you rob banks? And he goes, that's where the money is. So if people are going to hack, hack cryptocurrency, where are they going to go? They're going to go to the centralized exchanges because that's where the cryptocurrency is. <laughs> so so you, you, uh, you make yourselves a target by putting it in there and it goes up. So, but if you don't have, but you can do transactions with Bitcoin and with all these other tokens without having an exchange in the middle. You know, if you gave me your wallet address, I can just send you Bitcoin. You could just send me Ethereum, right? If you have my wallet address. Um, if we mutually agree that you're going to send me some Ethereum, I want to send you some Bitcoin, and we, we've got that ratio all worked out, we can just send them. We can exchange them. And we don't have to have an exchange actually making that market if we know each other. What the exchanges provide is they find ways of matching up buyers and sellers, and which is a very useful thing to do, but it's all in one place. So when you talk about the internet of transactions, how many transactions are there in real estate? <laughs> okay, um, you, you, you buy real estate, right? But that purchase could involve loans. It can involve cash. Uh, you might put a deposit down. Uh, you've got a title company. You're going to pay third parties. You're going to pay out commissions. Um, all those transactions happen just in a buy, purchase and sale. And then how many third party providers? You have inspectors, you have appraisers, you have all these other people that are happening. And then if you own real estate, especially if you own investment real estate, you you collect rent. Well, there's a transaction. Are you creating contracts for that? You got leases. You have purchase contracts. All these things are transactions. And right now, all these things are done through counterparties. You've got your your real estate broker helping out with a sale, uh, but they won't do the contract. Right? They're they're prevented. I, I'm I'm a real estate agent licensed in Maryland, and I know that I'm not allowed to write a contract. Um, I can use and fill out the approved contracts through, you know, realtors, uh, or I can advise the buyer to get a lawyer. Those are the two things that I'm allowed to do as a real estate agent. So you need the lawyer, you need the title company, you, and, and, and the title company might be separate from a closing attorney. I mean, it depends on what state you're in. All these transactions could be simplified in the blockchain, and in fact, they are right now. There are ways to do real estate contracts using a blockchain so that all the parties to the contract can see whatever the contract's current state is. Any of them can make edits. And when they're all agreed, they can sign it electronically online. Really cool stuff. And that's on the blockchain. So the, the actual, all the wording of that contract 
is is preserved so that you can verify if you show the wording you can you can go back and, and it's called a hash code you can go back and use that hash code and you can see that it matches what was actually signed and recorded so you have a permanent record of that contract um sales could be done the same way right the permanent sales they're not mostly because jurisdictions don't acknowledge sales unless they're actually recorded in the jurisdiction using the standard processes. So you have companies, you mentioned Proppy. Um, you have companies like Proppy that are working to find other ways of transferring the title. And they've done some very interesting things. Uh, they've auctioned off properties uh, with as NFTs. Uh, NFT stands for non-fungible token. So whereas most cryptocurrencies are fungible, say there's a, you know, it's 21 million Bitcoin and any one Bitcoin is exactly the same as any other Bitcoin, just as any $1 bill is the same as any other $1 bill, okay? Um, but these are unique tokens. So this is a one, one of a kind token that's issued. It's called an non-fungible token and it's NFT. And what they did was they, they took a house and they created an LLC and they transferred the title of the house to the LLC. And they created a non-fungible token that owned the LLC, had 100% ownership of the LLC. So now they can sell the NFT. And now they sold the house whenever they sell the NFT, because effectively they're selling the LLC. Does that make sense? That makes sense for me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's some downsides and there's some issues and challenges with that too. But it's a novel concept. And then, uh, you know, there's, there's ways of, of doing real estate syndications using tokenization. You right. get all kinds of advantages. It's called security token offerings. Um, and I, I'm, feel, feel free to, to jump in and, and right. uh, redirect me if you want to ask some questions. If not, I'll just keep rambling. <laughs> but, no, um, yeah, it's all good. But, and I've, I've heard of that, uh, the syndications, uh, syndications using NFTs and the benefits of that. I've, I've watched a quick little video. Well, the syndications don't use NFTs because they, they're right. having fungible tokens. So okay. they're security token offerings. So essentially, they're following all the securities laws. So just mm -hmm. like with a syndication, you create a, a private placement memorandum or PPM. You probably have an LLC that's going to hold the property. And under the PPM, uh, you're dividing the owner, you're fractionalizing the ownership of the LLC. And investors who invest will get part ownership of the LLC. Mm -hmm. Only that's the standard syndication. When you do a tokenization, those investors still get part of the LLC, right. only let's say they put $100,000, maybe they get 100 crypto tokens to, uh, to represent their ownership in the LLC. And you say, well, what's the big deal? <laughs> you know, you know it's, a, it's the same thing, right? Only now you have crypto tokens instead of a paper certificate. But the big deal is this, uh, legally, you can, you can sell, the, the, the investors who buy those tokens can legally sell them after holding them for a year. That's, that's typical. I mean, there's, there's some things that perturb that, but that's the SEC rules, right? You have to have a holding period and it's usually a year. After that year, you can sell them, but there's no marketplace to sell them with syndications because they're all private placements. And, and really it's kind of, you have to know somebody and that's how it's all been structured. With tokenization, you can create a secondary market for those tokens. So now imagine having a website where you could go and uh, you know, you've got $50,000 to invest and you wanna come in on the secondary market. Well, and maybe you wanna put 15,000 into a multifamily and 10,000 into self storage and you know, 20,000 into hotels and, and split your 5,000 and a couple of other things. Now you would have the ability to do that because you can buy smaller pieces, you can diversify your portfolio and people who've purchased, the biggest downside of going into a syndication is your money is gone for three, five, seven, 10 years, right? If you can do this, if you can get out after a year, that gives you a lot more flexibility in how you handle your investment dollars. And it gives you more velocity in your investment dollars. So, you know, if you come in and you've purchased and they do a value add and the value has gone way up and now it's going to kind of incrementally go up for the rest of your period, maybe you want to sell some of those at that point 
and then go come into another project that's at, at the new stage going into the value add, which also helps the people who are doing the syndications because now they can recycle their investors' monies faster. There's a whole, a whole lot of reasons to do that. And of course, the another big reason is that the price of real estate is usually factored in the fact that it's hard to sell. So you have an illiquidity penalty in the price of real estate. So when you remove that illiquidity penalty, it becomes liquid. Things that become more liquid become more valuable. So the chances are that the value of the real estate will go up just because you've tokenized it. Wow. That's, I never even thought about it like that. So we went from, and I love the way that you explained it, by the way. So I think you explained it in a way where it's easy for me to understand somebody who's like not, not really understanding crypto before. Uh, and I guess it's just the value of it, right? So I think that's that's mm -hmm. the way to explain it is the way that you did is that what value does it actually bring? Because there's a lot of people right. who just say, you know, cr blockchain technology or crypto, whatever, it's, just, it's the future. Well, well, like, why is it the future, right? Like, what does it actually accomplish? Well, from what I've, what I got from, you know, what you just said is essentially what it is, it's, it's an easier way to exchange value, which is basically what, you know, what currency, like, fiat currency, right? And money, that's what it is, right? Like, it's just a way to exchange value. You know, in the past, it was, you know, you give somebody a bag, of, a bag of beans, and then they'll give you, you know, whatever, whatever right. they have, right? A sheep, a goat or whatever. And then that has evolved into money. Um, so I guess my question now is, you know, with cryptocurrency and the ease of ease of exchange, I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, it's decentralized. And, that's the value of it. And I guess that's, do you think that's the, the case here because it's decentralized and there's not, because there's not as many hoops to jump through to make an exchange. We're almost going back to that stage where I was just talking about where you can just exchange value, except this is something that everybody kind of just recognizes and accepts as, okay, I, I will, I'll accept this. But if nobody accepts it, it isn't really, it has well, no value. Right? Well, there's a couple of different things in those questions. Um, but before we leave the tokenization, I just want to make a shameless plug, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'm, I don't mind. Yeah, go I'm, ahead. I'm, an, I'm an advisor for a company called Honeybricks.com, Honeybricks.com, and they're putting together this platform where you can have where, where people who want to do syndications can tokenize their assets on the platform, and then uh, people who want to buy assets can sign up and they can get notice of new new offerings on there and they can go in and, and do that. So. I would encourage people to go in and, and sign up yeah. for that platform. It doesn't cost anything to sign up. And, you know, you, you might find some really interesting stuff there. But to get back to your question, um, the decentralization is important, but it has a, has a really different feature to it. Prior to Bitcoin, there were four or five digital currencies that were developed. And every single one of those founders is either indicted or in jail. Government doesn't like competition. <laughs> no, they don't. So, <laughs> so, so when you're trying to compete with them for currencies, uh, they don't like it at all. They would have shut down Bitcoin if they could. And the reason they can't is because Bitcoin is maintained by tens of thousands of people around the world. And any group of those people can mutually agree on what the next block is. That's the decentralization. All those different people out there are mutually agreeing on what the next block is. And every, all the blocks are literally chained together with a cryptographic uh, code called a hash. Mm -hmm. And you don't really have to know how it works. What you have to know is that if any block in that chain is changed, the hashes don't work. You change one one letter, one number, one anything in any, any of those pieces of boxes, none of the hashes work. So you can always validate that you have the right one because when you run this validation algorithm, you get the right hash. So between the decentralization and that cryptography there, what you end up with is something that the governments can't attack very easily because there's no place, there's nobody to get. Right. Mm -hmm. Satoshi Nakamoto is is possibly apocryphal. <laughs> and he, he's he's the person who person who wrote the Bitcoin white paper. And uh, he famously disappeared soon after Bitcoin's launch 
and no one has really seen or heard from him. Occasionally I'll read articles saying, hey, we now know who, who he is, but I, I think that's all, it's all fake. Um, uh, he reminds me actually a little bit of George Washington in that sense, because right, George Washington was one of the first leaders ever to just walk away from president. He's the one who made it so that we would have a peaceful change of power in the United States, because otherwise they, they would have been happy to make him king back then. Him walking away set a precedent for future presidents to do the peaceful exchange of power. Satoshi Nakamoto walking away from Bitcoin, it turned it into a system and not a company or a person. So Bitcoin right. is really um, a, a, a wide ranging group of people all over the world who maintain it and improve it and work on it instead of an organization that controls it. And that's not true of most cryptocurrencies. Most cryptocurrencies are really created by a company and they support that company's goals. And so you have to look at them differently. Now, now there are people out there, they call them Bitcoin maximalists who say Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency worth looking at. And I am not in that camp at all. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of value in a lot of different cryptocurrencies, but there's also a lot of risk when you have a new cryptocurrency and it is not very decentralized yet. Because when you start it, how many different people are maintaining nodes? Only a handful. Uh, you have to get it to the point where there's enough different people around the world maintaining the nodes independently that now you're you're somewhat immune from um, unwarranted prosecution, right? You know, the, the government can't just go after you because they don't like you anymore or because you're being too competitive against the fiat currencies. So mm -hmm. fiat currency is how cryptocurrency people refer to what we think of as normal money. So right. it, it, they call it fiat currency because dollars and euros are, are money because the government says it is. Right. And that's a that's what I call an yeah. affirmative fiat. So, and that's where the contrast comes in, right? If you look at cryptocurrency, um, it might go up in value, it might go down in value. There's all, all, quite a bit of volatility, uh, volatility right now, especially because the the whole whole value of all cryptocurrency assets is still minuscule compared to things like stocks and bonds or real estate or or, or anything like that. Um, but what you don't have is with fiat currency, they'll go print, you know, 10 times the amount that we had two years ago. <laughs> and so, so they, right. they intentionally, I mean, I mean, the Federal Reserve's intentional policy is for there to be inflation, meaning that the, the currency is going to lose two and a half percent of its value every year. And right now, as we know with inflation, that's more like 10%, maybe more like 15%. So if you have a million dollars in the bank and they're dollars, next year, that million dollars is worth maybe $850,000. So you've lost $150,000 just by holding on to the money. So there's a lot of potential with cryptocurrencies, especially some of them, for you to maintain your purchasing power just as you can maintain purchasing power by buying other kinds of physical assets like gold. And, <clears throat> but the gold is hard to transact uh, in any sort of large quantities. So cryptocurrency is just as easy to send a billion dollars worth as it is to send $5 worth. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess like my next question on that is, the value of cryptocurrency, I guess there's, there's different ones. Right. And I guess like my first question will be, what's the difference between one, like what's the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum for, for somebody who just doesn't like kind of understand, like okay. they just see us, what, what, what is the difference between the two? Right. They can't see the so, same thing. So think of cryptocurrencies like companies. Okay. If you have, um, and I, I liken this whole crypto boom a lot to the dot com boom in the late nineties mm -hmm. at that point, any company that put .com after their name was investable. <laughs> and people put lots and lots of money into a lot of really bad ideas. Okay. And each one of those companies had a value proposition. Well, I'm going to do a website that's going to provide this service. We think we have this customer base. And so they would grow up. And I'm, I'm getting to, to the answer to your question. 
So right, yes. So the the these companies, uh, many of them went out of business, and of the ones that had good ideas, often the one that best implemented that idea managed to buy up all the others and consolidate. And so now you end up with with Google as kind of the search engine, a couple of minor yep. competitors. You have Amazon with the shopping place with some other competitors. You have eBay with a great place. You have Craigslist. You've got Yahoo. Uh, you've got Facebook. You know, you've got a whole bunch of things that became behemoths right? because they were the winner take all in a network effect. <laughs> so cryptocurrencies are a lot like that. They're the internet of transactions. So Bitcoin has a really strong money transaction approach. And, but their, their real idea is we're trading a, a piece of value re represented as a Bitcoin on our, on our blockchain. Ethereum came along and they said, well, we think you can do a lot more than just exchange value. We think you can actually run software on these exchanges and that software smart contracts can do a whole lot more things than just exchange you know, a token. And so... Uh, Ethereum has become very popular because a lot of people are writing what they call digital applications or dApps that run on top of Ethereum. So they're really recording apps and contracts instead of recording just a transaction. And so that was really so. Now there's all kinds of competitors. So those are those are separate blockchains, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Right. And now there's I think somewhere around 30 to 50 major blockchains, maybe more. Um, only a handful of them really seem to be popular. You have things like Cardano and Solano and um, Solana, I think, and um, EOS and, and Tron and, and, a, and a few others. And then you have a bunch of others that have figured out how to piggyback on top of Bitcoin or Ethereum. And they have what they call a level two blockchain. And so without going into a lot of great detail, uh, they want to minimize the cost of doing transactions. And so they, they'll bundle up a thousand transactions and put a hash of that onto the Ethereum right. blockchain. And then they pay one Ethereum transaction fee instead of a thousand. So that was part yeah. of the impetus behind it. But so now you have a lot of level two uh, blockchains and then you have tokens that ride on, on those. And, and at this point, there's somewhere around 15 to 20,000 cryptocurrency types. But if you think about it, every company could issue their stock as a cryptocurrency instead of the way they do it now. And uh, I would bet in, say, five years, every, com every company will. They will convert all their stocks to cryptocurrencies because it's just, frankly, much easier to manage. Having immutable registry for what happens to the stock would be great. Um, and then, you know, anybody, uh, have you ever flown on an airplane? You, do you have frequent flyer miles, <laughs> right? I just, I just got the, the rewards for one of the airlines. Yes. yes. So, so a lot of people have credit card points or they have frequent flyer miles yeah. and those are loyalty programs. And what they really are is very much like a cryptocurrency utility token. So a utility token provides allows you to pay for services when a business. Some of the big ones are games, right? So mm -hmm. you buy tokens in the games and then you can buy characters, you can buy right. equipment, you can buy, buy things in the games yeah. with the game tokens, mm -hmm. okay? Those tokens aren't worth anything outside the game, but you can buy stuff in the game. Just like frequent flyer miles aren't worth anything outside, but you can use it within the airline. So it wouldn't surprise me if almost every company develops a utility token so that they can have their own internal currency. There, there's a lot of uh, value in retaining customer loyalty by doing that. And you can do this with real estate too. I'm thinking especially if you were to buy a student housing complex and you, one, allow students to pay in cryptocurrency, which is a cool factor, but you also had your, your apartment coin and so the students might get issued those when they make their payments on time, or they might be able to buy them if they want them. And now maybe you can use them for valet trash. You can use them to reserve the clubhouse. If you save up enough, you can pay a month's rent. Um, so you have something that's valuable there 
as long as you're at the apartment complex, but it's not valuable anywhere else. So it will encourage people to stay at your apartment complex longer because they actually would lose money if they left. Right. So, I mean, that's another way to, of, of bringing uh, cryptocurrency into real estate. And I, I know it's yeah. a different topic. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm, list, I'm listening to this and like my mind is just, just is working so fast and like I'm trying to pick things up here and there. And then like I'm listening to all this information. They all like, the good thing about it is that they all kind of like, they make more sense now, which is why it, my mind is going different places. And, um, but yeah, no, thank you for kind of like, just for sharing all that you've had so far. And I can't wait to, to dig, dig even more deeper into this. So uh, question on that. So you mentioned the kind of like the loyalty program with certain coins, right? A certain blockchain mm -hmm. or, or just certain tokens, right? And then kind of, and maybe my terminology is not, not the best because I'm, I'm still newer at this, but um, my, my, I guess my question would be, you know, can, if a company were to issue their own, their own token, do they like, and this is, I guess, going back into more of the even more basic concept, which is they would need to have some sort of technology that would actually make it work. Or can they just say, we, they can't just say we launched this, like, this is our token and then just do nothing and just say it. Right. And then say, we have 2 million well, of this. Um, it's actually closer to that than the other. Because okay. Most of the blockchains have a facility for you to create a token on their blockchain. Mm -hmm. And I think it's either free or inexpensive and it can take you know five minutes. And then the token is available on the blockchain and you have all the mechanics of being able to trade it on the blockchain. What you might not have is some of the, the ease of use to find the tokens, to issue the tokens, to redeem the tokens. There's other things that you might wanna do, but you can create a token in about five minutes. It's really, really very easy to do. Um, now, that token just gets lost among all the others that are out there, unless you do some marketing, unless you put some value behind it. And then you also have to be very careful, right? Um, we all know that when you issue something, anything that, requires people to make a, an investment of money into a common enterprise with an expectation of profit, do so to a third party, that, that's, the, that's the Howey test, and that's a security. Yep. So if you create something and it's a, say I'm going to create a token and it's going to be represent ownership in my company, well, that's going to be a security. And so you still need to follow the securities laws for things like that. You need to do a PPM or private offering or a public offering, depending on what you're doing. And you have to follow all the SEC regulations for how you raise money for that. And a lot of people in cryptocurrency, especially back in like 2017, 2018, when it, when it was uh, this explosion of initial coin offerings, a lot of people thought, well, I don't have to do the securities laws. It's a utility token. I'm gonna call it a utility token. And so now I won't have to follow any securities laws. And the, the SEC takes a dim view of that. <laughs> and they, they're slow. They're pretty slow to move. But when they move, they, they've come and stopped a lot of uh, cryptocurrency companies, even some pretty large ones, because they were securities and they didn't follow the securities laws. So, I mean, this is something that I, I do to help people, right? I help them figure out how to issue tokens and how to use them in real estate. And I also work on, on buying and selling real estate with cryptocurrency, which we haven't talked about yet, um, because I think that's a really interesting approach for investors if they want to diversify their holdings or if they want to not get stuck in cash, if cash is going to be going down in value rapidly. Um, so there's lots of possibilities there. But yeah, it's, it's really pretty simple to create a, a, a cryptocurrency. Okay, yeah. So, the, I, and we can talk about uh, buying and selling real estate with cryptocurrency uh, next, right? That that'll be a good topic sure. for the for ne next. Uh, but you mentioned something there. I do want to kind of like dig a little bit more into it, if you don't mind. Um, you said if you create a so first of all, uh, cryptocurrencies they're they're right now they're considered securities, so it can't just be it's that, not just like a random that thing. Depends on the cryptocurrency. So Bitcoin okay. is it is okay. considered an asset. So is Ethereum. Oh, wow. Um. Uh, the SEC is currently pursuing action against Ripple, uh, XRP, 
because they say it's a security and XRP says it's not. Um, you know, I've read XRP's white paper. I, I think the SEC probably has a point <laughs> on this one, but I, I never predict how court cases like that are going to come out. Right. But if the SEC loses against XRP, they're going to have a lot more trouble with some of the other cryptocurrencies finding them to be securities. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I guess like that might, that's like what, what will transition into more of my, my question is like, how do you, you mentioned va putting value behind a certain cryptocurrency. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can clearly, you know, if, if this, this is a security that represents, you know, a portion of ownership in a certain company, clearly there's, there's value there. So what if like, consider like Bitcoin's considered an asset. So how, I guess, how would, how do they put value behind, behind that? Is it just. So, so Bitcoin is, is a really a market value. So what they right. have is they have, okay, here's these tokens. Do you want them? Is there a demand for them? And the answer is yes. Yeah. And is there a supply? And we know the supply is extremely limited. It will never go above 21 million. And we know exactly how they will be created and distributed. We know exactly the time frame for it. So the idea that if, if demand goes up and the supply remains restricted, what happens to the price? It goes up. But there is no common entity behind Bitcoin and there are no third parties which are driving the value. So it's not a security. That, that, that's, I'm not a securities attorney. Uh, that's my reading of it. But I do know that SEC has officially acknowledged Bitcoin is not a security. Right. It doesn't uh, represent a they, company. They, they originally declared Ethereum to be a security. And Ethereum fought it. And ultimately, they came out and they made a very, very interesting statement. They said, well, we no longer consider Ethereum to be a security because it is now decentralized, sufficiently decentralized. So that... That tells you something. I, I'm not going to go into great depth about what I think it tells you, but the idea was okay. if it's just decentralized enough, then maybe it's not really a third party anymore that is driving the value because right. it's decentralized. It's kind of public. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're not decentralized, sufficiently decentralized, you might be in that situation where you are considered a security, even if you're very much like Ethereum was. So, uh, so, so, but if you're issuing something and it represents ownership in your company, it is almost always going to be a security. Okay. And if you represent something that is fractionalized ownership of real estate, so you have multiple owners, not just one, mm -hmm. it's almost always going to be a security. Right. And there are some utility tokens that if you expect to have a profit, if they, if they advertise that you're gonna make a profit on the utility token, mm -hmm. that it's gonna go up in price, some of those utility tokens are probably gonna be securities as well. Okay. So uh, it, it's, it's challenging. There's some really very good guidance. Uh, SEC's guidance was kind of eh, but mm -hmm. the Congressional Research Service uh, did a report and they went into the details about what should allow cryptocurrencies be considered a, a, a security. And I thought their report was very well written and very clear. So they did a very nice job. What we can expect over the next, actually maybe very soon, because you know Biden's executive order came out about six months ago saying that we need to do all these studies about cryptocurrency and recommendations. And I believe those reports are due like now. And so when those reports come out, we may have a lot of uh, a lot of suggestions about how to regulate cryptocurrencies. Hmm. We'll see whether those suggestions are actually reasonable. Right. Is it is it not necessarily a good thing, or, or maybe maybe a good a good thing that they're regulating cryptocurrency? Because I think a lot of people they like the idea of cryptocurrency because it's not so much regulated as you know money is, right? So uh, I tend to like the idea that it's not regulated because I don't know yeah. that the governments know better. Yeah. Right. But, and the <laughs> government's know. interest is not is not necessarily to uh, be the interest of the people, to make people's right. lives better. The government is trying to protect the government's interest. And to that extent, you know, I tend to be uh, opposing regulation, but um, I, I think some regulation is inevitable. 
-hmm. The question is just how, how much teeth there will be in a regulation. So if you try to make, if you try to regulate Bitcoin, it's going to be hard because it's, it's wallets uh, in, right. in, 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 the, in the cloud. And who, who knows what jurisdiction they're in? And uh, it's maintained all around the world. Pretty much every country has some Bitcoin nodes. So, you know, who are you going to regulate and how? I'm not sure how you're going to do that. Um, the, here's, where, here's what happens, though. For Bitcoin, um, if you are just, if you have a wallet and you have Bitcoin in it and you want to trade with people that you know or even people that you don't know that you can trade wallet addresses with, you are completely outside the regulatory framework that's out there. But anytime you create an exchange that touches the bank so that somebody can take their bank account or their credit card and they can buy cryptocurrency, the banks and the credit card companies are heavily regulated. Mm -hmm. So any crypto exchange that touches the fiat inherits the fiat regulations. So they have to do know your customer, they have to do anti-money laundering checks, um, they have to keep accounts. And it wouldn't surprise me if they end up having to provide um, you know, reporting documentation for income tax at some point. Um, so that can get regulated. If you stay completely outside those financial realms, though, I'm not sure how government's going to regulate it. Which government regulates it? You know, it's not in a country. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So let's let's kind of take it back into more more relevance and uh, to real estate because uh, I, I mean this is really interesting for me, but I think the audience might want to listen more. On, on the real estate side. So I think we're just up in the air about the possibilities. Sure. Now let's kind of tie it back into, you know, what's what's in front of us, right? Like the exchange of real estate with cryptocurrency. So tell us a little bit about that, the benefits of it, how you're helping people do, do that as well. So when you buy real estate, typically, you're almost always buying with debt, right? So sometimes you'll get a mortgage, but even if you're paying with dollars, those are federal reserve notes. You're paying with debt. Right. <laughs> yeah. So you, whether right. you think about it or not that way. Um, yeah. When, when you pay with cryptocurrency, what you're doing is you're trading an asset for an asset. Mm -hmm. So it really helps to get in, in, in the mindset of equity marketing and real estate exchange. Because now you're saying, well, I'm going to give you this asset in exchange for your asset instead of I'm giving you dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think about structuring the exchanges that way, there's a lot of things that you can do, right? So obviously the simplest thing is um, I'm just gonna buy a property with all cryptocurrency. Well, that's cool. Uh, if the property has a loan against it, the, the lender is most likely not going to accept cryptocurrency for repayment. <laughs> so, so you, you can probably only do that with free and clear properties. Mm -hmm. Or you have to sell the cryptocurrency for cash and then use cash to buy the property, which was what was done a lot of times. People would tell me, yeah, I'm buying real estate with cryptocurrency. And that's what they were doing. They were selling the day of closing and, and liquidating the cryptocurrency and using the cash. I'm like, now nah, you're buying real estate with cash. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody can do that. <laughs> um, so trading it for for uh, cryptocurrency is, is, is good. But what I find um, when I'm talking with sellers is that usually they don't want all cryptocurrency. They might take 10 and 20% down. So maybe the down payment can be cryptocurrency and the rest can be cash. You still have a lot of challenges. Title companies don't know how, how to handle cryptocurrency. Um, I think Proppy has actually created a title company that right. does handle cryptocurrency and they work with some other title companies that do. There's like one, I think, that's really... Uh, writing title insurance and uh, accepting cryptocurrency when they do their whole closing process. Forward thinking title company, good for them. Um, but the others don't. When I did my closing, I had to create a closing process. I, I had to set it up so that we could figure it out. And I had to handle the cryptocurrency directly with the seller outside of the title attorney. And then, you know, we both sign something acknowledging that we had made that transaction so they could go and complete the rest of it. Um, we couldn't get title insurance. So the day after we closed, 
but title insurance. <laughs> they, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. Uh, they wouldn't give you title insurance in a transaction that involved cryptocurrency. But the day after closing, exact same transaction, you can go by title insurance because there's no cryptocurrency involved at that point. You just own the property. Right. Uh, that seemed to me to be the the height of stupidity. But you know, it's title <laughs> insurance. What do you do? Um, you have to worry about brokers, right? Real estate brokers. I, I've met some brokers that have been willing to accept cryptocurrency as commission. And I've met brokers that don't want cryptocurrency as commission or will take a split, some part and part. Um, but okay. if, you have, if you're a real estate agent and you have a lot of real estate agents on here, every single one of you should be thinking about how you're going to handle this because you will come to a transaction that involves cryptocurrency and you have to say, do I have to have cash for this? Can I take crypto? What cryptos would I take? How do I want to handle those? You want to be prepared because you want to provide the best service to your clients. So if you want to be able to do that and be a true fiduciary and the client is willing to accept cryptocurrency for their property, you might need to be willing to accept cryptocurrency for all or part of your commission. So that's something that real estate agents should be thinking about pretty heavily right now, at least positioning themselves so they know what to do when the question comes up. Um, <clears throat> I've talked about closings being a challenge. So there's, there's more than one way to use cryptocurrency in real estate, though. We talked about buying it with real estate, doing some of the down payment. There's a couple of times I've used cryptocurrency as a deposit. So sometimes sellers are willing to take it as a deposit even if they don't want it for the final sales price, mm -hmm. because it shows skin in the game while you're doing due diligence on the property. And so that's been essentially the cryptocurrency buys you time. And that's an interesting way to use it. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of ways where you can get loans secured by cryptocurrency, especially the, the, you know, the top half dozen or dozen cryptocurrencies. So you can get a loan which is secured by your cryptocurrency instead of by your real estate, you can use the loan to go buy real estate. So now you have two kinds of appreciating assets and you get you keep both of them. <laughs> and so now you use the cash as kind of an arbitrage to get to the real estate. It's really kind of an interesting way to go. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very uh, excited about those sorts of opportunities. Yeah. And then when you come to all that, effectively what you're doing then is you're cross collateralizing cryptocurrency and real estate but you could explicitly do that. You could get a real estate loan, add cryptocurrency as security, and maybe get a 100% loan for the purchase of the real estate. Uh, you might be able to use a cryptocurrency loan, add real estate as additional security to get better rate or terms on your cryptocurrency loan. So I think there's some really cool opportunities for cross collateralization there that helps both sides. Yeah, I was just going to say that it's like it can be used as a collateral now. So Right, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways to structure deals. Um, you, have to, you have to, because cryptocurrency is an asset, right. and it has a price that changes pretty regularly, you have to figure out, um, the, there's really two ways to specify cryptocurrency in, in a contract. Either I'm going to give you 100,000 extra options, not gold. That's one that's a cryptocurrency. I'm going to give you 100,000 of the tokens. And the value is not explicit in the contract. It's just number of tokens. Or you can say, I'm going to give you uh, $25,000 worth of extra options that go. And so, uh, and, and we'll set that price either contract, usually either contract execution or the day before closing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you know exactly how many extra options dot gold you're going to get to reflect that dollar value. And there's interesting reasons to do either of those. So if you do an asset for asset exchange, um, let's suppose you're a real estate agent or you're a real estate investor, you own an apartment complex, you think market value is probably a million dollars. And I say probably a million dollars. So depending on how you sell it and how you market it and where you go, you might get anywhere from 600,000 to 1.2 million if you actually sold it, okay? Well, let's say you've got crypto, your, your buyer has cryptocurrency and it's worth a million dollars, maybe, because 
you know, it goes up and down six to eight percent a day. And, you know, there's potential that it, it may not be uh, long lasting. So it could go lower. So, you know, is it worth a million? It might be worth less, it might be worth more. So if you're going to trade that cryptocurrency for that apartment complex, what's the value of the transaction? Is it a million dollars? Is it $600,000? Is it $1.2 million? Is it $800,000? It really could be any one of those numbers. Any one of those numbers is, is a reasonable approach depending on the circumstances and the beliefs of the two parties that are there. Mm -hmm. So when this comes down and you have, you get to worry about capital gains because now you, you bought that apartment complex for $600,000. Now you want to sell it for a million. Well, maybe you bought the cryptocurrency for $500,000 and you're going to sell it for a million. But if it really could be a $600,000 transaction and you mutually agree it's a $600,000 transaction, there's really nobody who can gain say you. Right? That that wow. that is I mean it really I mean you can you can agree to sell your apartment complex for 600,000. You could agree to sell your cryptocurrency for 600,000. It's mutually beneficial for both of you to agree that that purchase price is $600,000. And then what happens to the capital gains? It's a lot less than if you said the property yeah. is worth a million. Yeah. So 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 you can't do that with dollars. If I give you a million dollars for your apartment complex, everybody knows that that transaction was a million dollars. If I give you um, 250,000 extra options dot gold, um, nobody knows what the value of that transaction is. So you really have to state it. I mean, you really have to set a value. And uh, I've heard I've heard accountants that will say until you go to cash, there's no taxable transaction. My right. accountant says that's not true. That anytime you do an asset for asset exchange, you have to set a value, a mutually agreed value, and then you take that against whatever your basis was, whatever you paid for it, and how that's ever been adjusted, and you figure out whether you have capital gains or a capital loss. And so that's what my accountant tells me. And so I do what my accountant tells me, not what somebody else's accountant tells, right. tells them. Um, but but there, the, the point is there's some, when you're trading asset for asset, there's some flexibility in how you value both assets. Right. Because that, I mean, that's, that's really interesting that you brought that up. I never, I mean, obviously my mind just never goes there because I, this is like the first time I'm learning about all these, these different things for the first time here. But we think of like, certain cryptocurrencies they have a market value but it's not it's not like money where it's like it's it's set in stone right it's like you can determine the value of it well, well money's not set in stone right there are forex markets where you have dollars trading against euros trading against yeah. yen and those change hour by hour yeah. right and bitcoin you know bitcoin itself um i was getting notices every day for like three or four weeks for a while Bitcoin is up 6% today. Bitcoin is down 7% today. Um, and, and where is the Bitcoin price, right? Those prices, you have exchanges and those exchanges estimate what the market price is based on recent sales. But the recent sales might be different from one exchange to another. So, so I'm a data scientist, right? I know how to measure things and I understand uncertainty. Whatever that price is that you have on Bitcoin, there is an uncertainty around it. And that uncertainty depends on how you measure it and when you measure it. Right. And so, um, and, and then for other cryptocurrencies, that uncertainty is even greater. And I won't go into the mechanics of it, but for, for, for cryptocurrencies that are not very often traded, they're not very lightly traded, their prices can fluctuate, say, based on the price of Bitcoin without ever a trade having occurred. And so did the price change? It shouldn't have. It should be the same price as whatever the last sale was at the time and not the price of Bitcoin changing. But due to, to some quirks in the way, um, way cryptocurrencies are priced, um, almost all the cryptocurrencies prices will fluctuate with the Bitcoin price. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in an exact proportion to the fluctuation of the Bitcoin price. So that's true of, of, of probably 10,000 of the 15,000 cryptocurrency. Right, because they see it as like a, a standard or, or like a benchmark, right? Well, the well, it's not, sees not even that. The way they calculate the price is they take the last trade of that cryptocurrency with Bitcoin and then the last trade of Bitcoin with dollars mm -hmm. and they combine the two to get you a, a trade for dollars. But if the last trade that you did for Bitcoin was a week ago and Bitcoin has dropped half of its value, there's really no reason to believe your coin has dropped half of its value. But if you do that calculation, it will say that your coin has dropped half of its value. Okay. It's, it's a weird thing. It's called trading pairs and it's a way of, of, of calculating prices. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just, that's just getting into the real mechanics of it, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess that's, which is fascinating to me as a data scientist, <laughs> but, but it may not be of that much interest to a real estate investor. Right. But I mean, I think like, like I said, I think before we even got on this, like before we started recording the podcast, like this is, this is something that's very interesting to me. Uh, personally, I, and I do know this is like a topic that a lot of investors and even agents, like you mentioned, they should be able to, because of the way that the world is moving in right now, they should be able to set up their way of essentially accepting crypto as, as a commission. So maybe we can finish, finish off the, wrap it up with this kind of like this relevant to all the agents out there. You know, what do you suggest a real estate, a real estate agent do now um, to, to be able to set that up? What, what should they be doing? be doing should they get like crypto certified should they go in and so um i think there's a couple things crypt, crypt uh, agents can do one is they can at least get a wallet maybe spend okay. a couple hundred bucks on cryptocurrencies just so they can see how things move and understand the mechanics yeah it's it's a really cheap education and it gets you kind of involved in the world um it's worth staying up on the news about cryptocurrency. And it's not hard these days. It's, it, it, it's in the mainstream news, what's going on with cryptocurrencies. Yeah. But it's worth staying up on the news. And then lastly, they can think about either marketing to people who have cryptocurrency as potential buyers mm -hmm. or talking with their sellers about accepting cryptocurrency to increase uh, the market that they can attract. So those are some things. And then I guess the last thing is really to think about what would they do? You know, how would they act? What would be the steps they would take if they received an offer of cryptocurrency for a seller? They would want to think it through in advance, do a little research. That way, when it comes in, they're not flying blind. They can actually have sort of a plan and a process. And that's the, um, that's the kind of thing that you know I can help with in case. So, so I, I do some amount of consulting and I do do work with people and help them figure out how to get around crypto and how to talk the talk and all that. But I, I really think that's a, uh, just becoming familiar with the space is useful so that when you do get that offer of, I'd like to buy your, your seller's house, but I wanna buy it with cryptocurrency they know to ask, well, which cryptocurrency, you know, how you get, what, what, what's the offer? Uh, they may have a lawyer that, that they can contact or some, some language they can suggest to a lawyer for how to write it up in a contract. Cause it's not gonna go in your, your National Association of Realtors yeah. contract, not for a couple of years. No. Uh, it has to be an addendum of some sort. Um, there's a lot of things you can do there that I think are worth doing. And, and it's just, it's all prep work, but it will happen. I, I've had you know, several realtors come out to me and say, hey, I got this offer. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> and it's not that hard. It, take a deep breath. It isn't that hard. Um, it's a little crazy, but realtors have to deal with all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, believe me, cryptocurrency is much easier than dealing with an HOA. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, I'm doing that on a sale right now. <laughs> Dealing with an HOA? Yeah, well, I, I'm actually selling a property and the, the last step to closing is the HOA has to somehow approve the buyer's oh. application. Like they should have a say. And <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that could get, that could get messy. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. I mean, 
thank you so much, Steve, for, I mean, just on my behalf, I've learned a lot. This is very eye-opening for me uh, today. Uh, I don't know if, you know, from your experience, what, you know, the questions I was asking, maybe they were a little bit basic, but for me, I mean, that was very helpful. It's, it's actually, uh, it's actually good to have basic questions because right. it gives me a, a frame and it knows, it allows me to know where to build a framework mm -hmm. and, and where to meet you where you are, which is important is there's a wide range of knowledge out there about cryptocurrency. And so, you know, I'm used to working with realtors who can spell Bitcoin and that's about it. Right. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of people who come in as complete naysayers. And once they hear about it and they see it, they say, well, you know, I don't need to dismiss it. I'm not sure I really want to do it, but, but uh, this, might, this might be something that's up and coming. Right. Yeah, I guess I was kind of in that camp before, before, uh, you know, I decided to take a deeper look into it. I was more of like the naysayer camp than the, you know, I think this is going to blow up the world and, and be the best thing ever. Um, but then I started researching more people who are interested in the subject, uh, like yourself, who are an experts in these subjects. And you look like a, you know, a professional person who knows what he's talking about. And you're not like just some, some kid who's, you know, got a crypto, like a, Bitcoin hat on and you know, he owns like 20,000 NFTs. I have been a kid for a while, that's for sure, except at <laughs> <the> heart. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. So you definitely know what you're, what you're talking about. You're not just somebody who's, you know, hyped about the subject. It's, you know, what I, you know yeah. kind of what I'm- Well, sort of well I, I'm a, I, I tend to call myself a willing skeptic mm -hmm. in many cases about many things. So I'm willing to be convinced, but I tend to go into things thinking maybe I shouldn't right. do this. And- there are some things about cryptocurrency that I, I don't speculate in cryptocurrency. I don't yeah. buy things thinking they're going to go up in price. I just don't do it. Um, I, I, I'm really a believer that I'm looking for those, those approaches that are providing a new way to do transactions that are better than what we have before. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to, to get involved with that. So I, I really believe in property tokenization. I think that is huge. I don't think there's any downside, and I think it's it's it still works on top of the value of the real estate as opposed to the value of the cryptocurrency. The cryptocurrency is a placeholder. Um, I, you know, I've had really good luck with value on cryptocurrency. I've had some challenges with liquidity, which is something you have to think about when you get into cryptocurrency. Some of the the the, the less known coins and tokens. Uh, might look like they go way up in value, but they're really hard to sell. So, you know, you, you think, oh my gosh, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. Now, I, you know, that in five bucks will buy me a cup of coffee. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so you have to be, be careful with it, but it's an interesting world. I really do believe that the way transactions are done will just completely change over the next few years. Yep. Definitely. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for, for doing this. A couple of questions before I let you go here. Um, first of all, uh, this is very eye-opening for me. Like I said, would you ever be willing to come back again and, and be a guest on a, on a different show or on sure. the same podcast again, ever? Sure. Leave yeah, the door you, open? You could, bring, you could bring me back on. Um, maybe we can uh, refine a topic, pick a, a smaller, smaller topic, right. an overall cryptocurrency and see if we can dig into something. Right, yeah, because there there were some things mentioned today that I, I do want to kind of dig into a little bit a uh, little bit deeper as well uh, sure. for for certain topics, and I'll I'll do my research. I'll definitely get your book, by the way. <laughs> sure, yeah, the book is available on Amazon. It's called Cryptocurrency and Real Estate, mm -hmm. and uh, my name is Steve Streetman, so you can look it up by my name or by the title. It's got a sort of a picture of a of a house that's like a puzzle pieces with a Bitcoin in it on the yeah. cover. It's white cover with that, so it's easy to find. Right. Um, a, I've been very blessed with really good reviews on it. So I'm, I'm happy about that. And I didn't pay for any of them. <laughs> they're all, they're all, uh, and, and I'm not they're real. I, most of them aren't even friends of mine. So <laughs> it's good. Um, but yeah, please buy the book. I think it's, it's, it's a, a pretty good read. And then um, I have a class. It's a, if you go to crypto re book.com, that is a, a website I've got. I, I'm not doing nearly as much with it in terms of providing more information as I should, but I, I hope to kind of re-engage with that and start getting regular information out to people. But that's, um, 
you can buy buy the book there, uh, ebook, or you can get to the Amazon page. And there's a class on selling your your real estate for cryptocurrency, which is also available there. Yep, awesome, awesome. And, I, and I'm always happy to uh, to consult with people and come up with other other uh, ways of looking at it. There's there's some really interesting projects that people have talked to me about when maybe coming down the pike, but it's premature to, okay. to bring those up on a podcast. <laughs> right, definitely. And um, so I guess for, for people that do want to reach out to you, um, what are some good platforms? To, I know we, we uh, connected on LinkedIn. Do you, is that a good platform for people to reach out to? Or? LinkedIn is the best platform to reach me. And, you know, you look for Steve Streetman. Um, I'm not sure how many Steve Streetmans there are on LinkedIn. I may be the only one. <laughs> if, you, you know, if you see cryptocurrency and Steve Streetman is a pretty darn good bet, it's me. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'll put it in the show notes as well. I'll put the link to your, your LinkedIn, the link to your website, and also the mm-hmm. link to your book on, uh, on Amazon. Uh, thank you so much for, for doing this. One last question before I let you hop off here. And uh, do you think that cryptocurrency will replace money that we know today, one day down the line? So... Very good question. Um, a lot of people who have money are trying to use it to replace money, right? There, mm-hmm. There's these central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. So there's the thought that dollars might go away and be, instead of dollars, the government would issue a dollar token CDBC. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of fear of that because it's so much easier to track transactions on the blockchain so there's the, the fear that the government would have insight into everything that you bought and would be able to restrict or control if they don't like what you're buying, right. which is really frightening. Um, so yeah. there's a potential for that. Um, most of the fiat currencies are being printed out of existence. Mm-hmm. Right? The dollars are, are being printed willy-nilly. Euros are being printed willy-nilly. You know, all these other currencies are being intentionally devalued. And it could very well be that at some point people just say, screw it. We're not going to deal with those anymore. You already have El Salvador has gone to Bitcoin. Um, I believe there's two other countries. I don't know if they've actually done it or if they're about to. And there's like two or three more that are looking at it. Uh, when, When the cryptos start to become official currencies, especially if they're not on a government controlled blockchain, if they're really on a truly decentralized blockchain, I think it could replace. Now, I think Bitcoin would be challenging to replace as reserve currency. It sort of acts like a cryptocurrency reserve currency, but it's, I think Bitcoin has some challenges that might not allow it to get there. Uh, Having a government do it will be worse than dollars. Right. They'll still be able to mint as many as they want, only they'll be able to see every transaction you do. It's, it's just like the worst of all possible worlds. And uh, they'll control all of the blockchains that, all, all the instances of the blockchain that run it. So they'll be able to wipe out your accounts or do whatever they want with them anytime they want. So it, yep. uh, the government, the CDBCs, I think, are, are a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Uh, they may happen, but they're a nightmare. Right. So All currencies digital now, right? That's right. some printed, but the ninety-five percent of U.S. dollars are just decimal points in a bank account. Yep, they aren't actual printed things. And I, I think currency will become largely digital. Mm-hmm. Um, the question is whether the currencies are issued and controlled by countries. And I don't, I'm not sure. I know the answer to that. I know what the countries want. And I know yeah. what would be better for people. And yeah. those aren't the same thing. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> yeah. But uh, wow. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, again, for uh, helping uh, helping us, helping me out, understand us a little bit better on this subject and our audience as well. On behalf of the audience, thank you so much for, uh, for doing this and uh, having this interview. Make sure to reach out to Steve for anything you need uh, when it comes to, well, not everything you need, but for consulting uh, on cryptocurrency make sure to get his book uh check out his class as well um anything else you want to leave with the audience before we uh before we sign off here uh cryptocurrency is nothing spectacular there's a lot, whole bunch of things out there that are really cool and this idea that you can do transactions without counterparties has a, a lot of legs it's going it's going to change things um 
but don't be afraid of it. You know, get involved a little bit, do what you can, learn about it. You'll be fine. Yep. All right. That's a great message to leave us, uh, leave us with. And I thank you again, Steve and audience. Thank you for uh, tuning in and I will see you guys next week. Take care.